it will look like in the long term. An inverted pyramid with each age group as you go down from older to younger, smaller and smaller. This is a population that's going to halve every 65 years if sustained without, without in migration. It's a prospect that delights environmentalists. Uh, there are strong pressure groups in England calling for a halving of population. But it absolutely horrifies economists and politicians. A, because a, an ever-decreasing labor force has to support, a bit like Hercules, this giant number of old people. And it alarms politicians because if Europe does halve in size every 65 years or so, uh, Europe's role in world affairs is almost bound to diminish. This, incidentally, is what a population structure with a total fertility rate of two looks like. A much more beautiful beast, you might say, with, with cohort sizes pretty even uh, across the age groups. Can migration come to the rescue? Well, the third row of figures, these, these figures on the right, are all in millions. In the late 90s, it is thought that Europe had in migration of about a million a year, a little under a million a year. If you wanted to keep the population from declining, you would have to double that. If you wanted the age group 15 to 64 constant in size, you'd have to treble the number of migrants. If you wanted to keep the ratio of 15 uh, of workers, 15 to 64, that ratio to the old folk at above three, three workers per retired person, you'd have to quadruple the number of in migrants per year to four, four and a quarter billion. And if you wanted to keep the ratio of workers to people 65 or more, you'd have to raise in migration to 25 million. Now, it's pretty clear to me from those figures that while migration may have a positive role to play in Europe's development. It can never be on the scale to make a serious impact on population, on population aging. So Europe has to face an aging and growing population. It has to adapt to it. And I think we're rich enough and clever enough to do that. We need to reform pension systems. Uh, we need to increase labor force participation amongst the 15 to 64 year olds, which is only typically about 60% in, in Europe as a whole. And above all, we need to raise the retirement age. Many governments are doing that. Um, certainly the UK is doing it. I'm not sure about the Netherlands. It's deeply unpopular. Uh, but I point out that 65 year olds today are much fitter than 65 year olds were uh, 50 years ago. Um, but there are some nasty inequities. Why should a manual labourer who started work at 16 be more or less forced to work to 70 when his better educated professional counterpart, as I've already pointed out, didn't start work till 25? So it might be fairer to base retirement ages on length of work life rather than chronological age. But it's absolutely inevitable that people will have to work longer. The pension systems have to be revised, uh, radically overhauled. And, and, and we can do it. I don't see any huge crisis as long as fertility doesn't stay chronically low. So uh, along with policies um, of raising the retirement age, I think countries with very low fertility are justified in trying to nudge up the birth rate. And the way to do that, surely, is to make, make childbearing and work, parenthood and work, more compatible. Um, by more flexible labor markets, flexible work hours, greater encouragement of part-time work, um, to suck people in who want, into work who want to also raise a family. And in support of that agenda, it's worth pointing out that the countries in Europe with the highest female labor force participation have the highest fertility. So that's the way ahead in terms of fertility.
Okay, so much for the advanced industrialized countries. Quite severe adjustments to be made, but I think no crisis, as long as fertility nudges up closer to that two-child mark. We're going to discuss very briefly the middle group of countries, basically Asia and Latin America, where fertility has declined from six broadly down to three or thereabouts, giving rise to a sort of age structure that looks like a bit like Korea in 2000, although the Korean fertility decline was so severe that the typical age structure in Asia and Latin America is more bell-shaped without the undercutting of the age structure here that you see in Korea. Um, the priority here is to increase employment. If you can do that, huge economic strides can be made because it is, I repeat, a very favorable age structure for rapid social and economic development with this high ratio of workers to dependents. Um, now, it's easy to say raise employment for this burgeoning labor force, uh, but not so easy to achieve. And I, I'm not an economist, and I won't go into ways in which employment prospects can be made more buoyant than they otherwise would. But it's worth pointing out that if, with a growing labor force, particularly of young men between 15 and 24, at the youth bulge, that if employment prospects are poor, um, there's some evidence that an age structure with lots of young men is prone to civil unrest and extremism. So the demographic bonus can turn sour if other conditions are not favorable. The other priority for Asia and Latin America, I think, is to reduce the very huge um, differences in childbearing between rich and poor. We know that poor families we know that families with lots of children are more likely to set, descend below the poverty line. And when they do that, they're less likely to rise up above the poverty line again. We know that children uh, from large families are less likely to be well educated, less likely to be well clothed, less likely to be well fed. In other words, their human capital is impaired. Now, there are in most Asian countries and most Latin American countries very big income differentials in childbearing. Uh, a recent analysis showed that in a, a largest group of such countries, the, uh, the poorest fifth of women had in their lifetime two unwanted births, compared with a mere half unwanted birth on average for the richest quinta. And that big fertility differential tends to entrench income inequalities for the reasons I've just described. So. A second priority um, after employment would be to decrease the rich-poor differential in fertility and thereby make a contribution to reducing income inequality. Here we have the symbol of the remaining countries, mostly in Africa, with high population growth and high fertility. And in this chart is the key to understanding why high population growth and high fertility is such a disadvantage for economic and social development. I repeat, half the population in this sort of age structure is under the age of 15. Then you have to ask yourself, how is it that some countries escape from poverty? Um, good governance, fair trade. But the key to development is surely increases in human capital, the skills and educational level of the workforce, an increase in what you might call physical capital per worker. Machines instead of hose, tractors instead of hose, uh, factories instead of uh, little sh shops with blow torches on the roadside. That's the key for making people rich. And this age structure is unfavorable both to increasing human capital and for generating the savings to invest and increase physical capital per worker. And the reason for that is that a huge number, huge resources have to be, have to be devoted